The book is called 100% American, uh, and it's about the 1920s Ku Klux Klan, which was one incarnation of a body that has generally been viewed as continuous, but in fact, the Klan of the 1920s was distinctive. Uh, it was, first of all, a mass movement. Three to five million Americans belonged at a time when the country had about 100 million people, so that's a substantial percentage of the population. Uh, it was also, unlike other incarnations of the Klan, it wasn't primarily a violent organization, although it was marked by violence in certain areas, the Southwest, the South, that were traditionally violent anyway. Uh, but the Klan of the 20s was big in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, were important um, realms. There was a New England clan, there was a New Hampshire clan, a Maine clan, there was a clan in Boston. Uh, so it was a national organization. And what the book tries to do is to take 20 or 30 years worth of scholarship about small outposts of the clan and put it together as a general history to show how this organization rose into influence, what its issues were, how it, how it achieved some influence in American society, but ultimately uh, fell apart. I, I guess the, especially for an audience that uh, uh, would be interested in some of the things that Loyola University is interested in is the, the 1920s Klan was interested in protecting what they saw as Americanism. And that was, first of all, anti-Catholic. There was a feeling that Catholicism was antithetical to American values. This is very interesting because it's a time when the United States is becoming a more Catholic, more diverse nation. And so the Klan is kind of fighting this rear guard action. It's one reason why it didn't succeed, ultimately. Uh, but as part of that, in, in interesting ways, the Klan also had a very narrow kind of racial slash ethnic perception of what American was. Uh, uh, for instance, to Klansmen, Italians weren't quite, weren't quite like white Americans. Now this is something that was true in the late 19th century, but by the 1920s, a more diverse and inclusive sense of American identity was beginning to develop in the United States. And so that's really the area of friction. The second thing that was really interesting about the Klan movement was there was a very strong fraternal basis to it. I mean, it was a club, essentially, for men, for white Protestant men. And uh, the original founder in 1915, Colonel William Simmons, who was a nut, um, uh, uh, he was mainly interested in the fraternal stuff. He was overthrown in a uh, struggle for power by a Dallas dentist named, um, <laughs> named Hiram Evans. And Evans had a vision of political influence for the Klan. And so he emphasized the anti-Catholicism. This is one of the things that, that kind of gets at why historians do what they do. Uh, there was an ordinary quality to the 1920s Klan. I mean, three to five million people in the United States, you can't say they're all, they're all nuts. Uh, it, it touches on some kind of vital concerns in the United States. It was a country that still thought of itself as being mainly Protestant, essentially white, with the power base tied to that group. That was changing in the United States, but there was friction and concern over that. The Klan also spoke to uh, a disappointment with political leadership, governmental organization, and prohibition in particular was a big recruiting tool for the Klan. Many Klansmen actually didn't, wouldn't have supported prohibition, but once it became a law, they said, if a law is being flouted, that's bad for our democracy. And when they didn't see substantial enforcement, and there was never real strong enforcement of prohibition for various reasons, they didn't fund enough money for it, for one thing, um, they volunteered their services. Now, in certain other clans, they had beer at their meetings. Uh, it really depended on the, the, the locale. The clan is interesting to write about, first of all, because it had that important, uh, uh, influential touch in the 1920s. And it aspired to political uh, influence. That's where it fell apart, really. That, that's where the divisions came up. And, and they were bad at politics. They did elect people to office, and they were chumps. Uh, uh, they got outmaneuvered by the professional politicians and they didn't deliver on their promises. Um, but the Klan was interesting to enough Americans and powerful enough to influence politics. It's hard to do a study of a secret organization. You have to find very scarce membership roles. You have to uh, dig up stuff. So that was done for about 20, 25 years at the local level. What I'm trying to do is put it together in an, into a new national picture of the Klan. 
that really argues for the distinctiveness of the 1920s organization. Um, so one thing that, uh, uh, that I think readers would come away with is a sense of the complex and sometimes contradictory nature of the past. Also a sense of historical timing and distinctiveness. The Klan of the, that opposed the Civil Rights Movement was a distinctive organization from the 1920s Klan, although it built on its principles and its, uh, its, its outlook and certainly its regalia and, and, and things like that. And, and a sense of what politics means, uh, for me this is very important, politics functions not just every four years at the polls or every two years at the polls, it's a daily concern over how life is lived, whose standards will prevail, how does, uh, how does representation work in a community, who pulls the strings. The Klan in part was responding to that in a way that was ultimately seen as negative in the United States. I mean, the Klan failed partly because 1920s Americans didn't view it as a mainstream organization, even though it approached the mainstream. 